Today we're going to talk about chapter 13 from our book, which is why we need statistics. And first of all, we'll ask, what are statistics? Well, they are quantitative measurements of samples. Um, Benjamin Disraeli, who was a British Prime Minister, gave a different definition. He said there are three kinds of lies. Uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And that might be a better definition. What do statistics tell us? Well, we have two different types, descriptive and inferential. Uh, descriptive statistics give us central tendency and variability, so things like the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of a distribution. Inferential statistics allow us to draw conclusions um, about a parent population from a sample. Um, and so that's really the statistics, the tests that we're going to talk about. Might be a better way to put it. Your book tells a story about uh, a detective and uh, the person's probably guilty, and um, in statistics, we can only state that the independent variable probably affected the dependent variability. So it's the probability given the evidence. Um, and by the way, this is a false example in your book, because in experiments, we actually manipulate the antecedent conditions and observe the whole time. So we would be able to see what happened uh, with Ms. Adams. Um, are the, is she guilty? Um, what's the motive? That's the, the question the detective should be asking. Don't they watch crime shows? We can't uh, prove the independent variable definitely caused uh, the change, but we can state the probability that our conclusion is um, correct. So it's basically internal validity stated probabilistically, if you want to think of um, it that way. So what is a sample in a population? Uh, a population's uh, really any set of people, animals, or whatever that have at least one characteristic in common. So it could be college sophomores, it could be American asthmatics, uh, male American asthmatics. They have at least one characteristic in common. Uh, a sample is a subset of that population, and we use that to draw inferences about the population. Uh, a key point to keep in mind is that samples are much smaller than populations. Let me give you an example from the presidential election of 2012, uh, which uh, President Obama won, um, and Joe Biden. 125 million people voted in that election, but accurate polls would, uh, or polls were able to, to interview only 2,000 people and accurately predict how the population was going to vote. So 2,000 people could accurately predict the voting habits of 125 million people. Um, and so that's, it shows the power of uh, statistical methods here. So what is statistical inference? Um, we essentially, like I used in my, our, the voter behavior example, we extrapolate from our sample to the population from which it's drawn. Um, the differences in scored, scores, um, basically when the researchers uh, report an outcome like that, it means that there was no treatment effect. So they're saying that the independent variable has no effect. This is what's predicted by the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is saying that whatever uh, treatment that we do uh, has no effect until we can uh, prove otherwise. What is variability? Well, it's the spread of scores um, around the average. Uh, if you want to think of that, st statisticians hate the word average uh, because it gets misused. Uh, they prefer measures of central tendency, like mean, median, or mode. But uh, it's easiest to think of variability as the spread of scores around some um, average. So which of those uh, samples has the most variability? Well, the one with the largest possible range of scores, so that overarching one there. Um, as a note, our sample always systematically underestimates the amount of variability in the population from which it's drawn. And you can do a very simple thought experiment on this. Consider the height of people in a classroom you can figure out what the variability is in the classroom, but the variability in the population is always going to be greater. There's always people who are taller and smaller 
in the general population than there are um, those people in the classroom. Even if you have a um, you know, classroom of basketball players, there's still going to be people taller and smaller um, than them. What is the null hypothesis? Uh, it's a statement that scores came from the same population and the independent variable does not significantly affect the dependent variable. This is what we assume to be correct until we can prove otherwise. So until we can, we can prove otherwise through our statistics, we have to assume that the independent variable has no effect on the dependent variable. So what is statistical significance? Um, the difference between our treatments groups exceeds the normal variability of scores on the dependent variable. So the means uh, between the two groups are so different uh, given the variability in the samples. The alpha level is the significance level that we set. And so uh, 0.05 is the standard that we use in the social sciences, uh, but people can go with 0.01 or, or even more. But uh, the alpha level is your chosen level of significance, and it's, it's, you can actually choose it. So, The alternative hypothesis, H1, or sometimes represented as H um, sub A, <clears throat> that's the statement that the scores came from different populations, and the independent variable has significantly affected the dependent variable. <coughs> Excuse me. So the distributions look so different, meaning that they have very little overlap, that we can say that the independent variable had a significant impact on the dependent variable. So the means are significantly different given the variability of the samples. When can you reject the null hypothesis? Um, when the differences between treatment groups exceed the normal variability. So our entire goal of the research, um, of research, is to reject the null hypothesis because we want our independent variable uh, to have a statistically significant impact on our dependent variable. What about frequency distributions? Well, that's the number of uh, people on each value of the, of the dependent variable. This is probably the most common way to present data. Uh, if you've ever seen a normal or bell curve, that's a frequency distribution. What does it reveal? Well, let's talk about the, um, the horizontal or x-axis, which is the abscissa, or the vertical or y-axis, which is the ordinate. Uh, you can calculate the total number of participants by adding the frequencies, that's true. Or you could read the methods section of the paper where the counting is done for you. Some people are very thorough, they want to come up with their own numbers. Why does rejecting the null hypothesis depend on data variability? Um, it's, as, as I've been saying, um, really what statistical significance is, is the difference uh, in means given the variability in the samples. Okay, so that's why we're always interested in not just the, the means, but what's the spread of scores like. So the greater the variability, the larger the, dif the difference between groups uh, in order to reject the null hypothesis. Um, true. So uh, your distributions are likely to have some overlap. What's the difference between directional and non-directional hypotheses? Well, a directional hypothesis predicts the direction of difference um, based on the independent variable. This is also called a unidirectional hypothesis. Uh, you believe that the independent variable will affect the dependent variable in a very specific way. So you can make predictions based upon that. You could also do a non-directional hypothesis. Uh, two groups have different values on the dependent variable. This is also called a bidirectional hypothesis. And it says basically that we expect an impact of the independent variable on the dependent variable, but we're not sure of the direction. So um, although it probably shouldn't be, the non-directional or bidirectional hypothesis is the standard in scientific research. Um, it's what we usually go with. The significance level, or alpha, are criteria for deciding whether to, ex to 
we never accept the null hypothesis. We either reject it or we fail to reject it. So I have to disagree with that. The selection is pretty arbitrary. I think I might have said that earlier. Uh, what we should use as an alpha level. Um, we usually use 0.05 though, or 0.01. So what does that mean? Well, 0.05 means that um, it would happen five times out of 100. It's so unlikely. Um, so one time in 20. Uh, we could also go with 0.01, which means one time in 100, or 0.001, which means one time in 1,000. Uh, we can set a more stringent criteria for the alpha if we choose. It's really up to the researcher. But there are consequences like type 1 and type 2 errors. So type 1 errors are rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually correct. Um, so the probability of rejecting your null hypothesis when it is in fact correct is equal to alpha. So if you set a more stringent level for alpha, you decrease your chances of type 1 error. However, by decreasing your chances of a type 1 error, you increase your chances of a type 2, and vice versa. So a type 2 error is, oh, I hate that word, accepting the null hypothesis. We never accept the null hypothesis. Um, it's failing to reject a null hypothesis um, when it's false. So... Um, Yes, a type 2 error is failing to reject a null hypothesis that is, in fact, false. You can lower your chances of making a type 2 error, but then you increase your chances of making a type 1 error. It really comes down to, for your particular situation, do you want to avoid making a type 1 or a type 2 error more? The American Psychological Association uh, Research should in, researchers should include estimates of effect size and confidence intervals in addition to p-values. So the p-value is um, how likely are your results, essentially. Uh, at conferences or even in journals, they really just judge your research based on the p-values. So one of my research students was very upset. We, we got some research that was rejected by the Midwestern Psychological Association because our, our p-values weren't um, significant enough. And she said, uh, MPA are a bunch of p-value whores, which I thought was a hilarious quote at so many levels. What is effect size? Well, essentially, it's the impact of the independent variable. So uh, an example I've been using, drinking four Red Bulls would likely have a significant impact on heart rate. And so we're able to um, estimate that effect size. A confidence interval is a range of values above and below a sample mean that's going to contain the population mean. And that's correct. So the mean of the population, or the true mean, if you want to think of it that way, would fall somewhere within that confidence interval. So um, yeah, so those are valuable too. A critical region, the region of the distribution of a test, test statistic sufficiently extreme to reject the null hypothesis. We would call this uh, the area of rejection. So at 0.05 is extreme, 5% um, of the distribution. At 0.01, the extreme 1% of the distribution. The shaded critical region here. Well, the top represents a bidirectional or two-tailed test because we look at both tails or ends of the distribution. Um, the bottom is a unidirectional or one-tailed test uh, where you concentrate your area of rejection at one end of the distribution. So what are one-tail and two-tail tests? A one-tail test has a critical region, <laughs> region at one tail, um, so that's a unidirectional hypothesis. A two-tailed has two critical regions. Um, that's a bidirectional hypothesis. And then finally, what is the function of inferential statistics? Well, they allow us to predict the behavior of a population from a sample. And so examples of inferential statistics are the t-test and the f-test, which is a preview of the next chapter. But that wraps up chapter 13, and thanks for listening.